Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining this webinar this morning. Uh, so I'm Patrick Chanazon from Docker, and today we're going to talk about uh, a notion uh, that we introduced recently, that's the container as a service. So first, a little bit about myself. So I'm Patrick Chanazon. I work as a member of technical staff at Docker. Uh, before joining Docker, uh, I've been involved with many different companies, 10 years building platforms, and then 10 years evangelizing them. Uh, the, the past three ones that I've, where I've worked at are kind of relevant. Uh, at Google, I was in charge of the Google App Engine developer relations team when platform as a service was created. Uh, then I moved to VMware uh, to do developer relations for Cloud Foundry, which is another platform as a service that's open source. Uh, and then I moved to Microsoft where uh, they have a platform as a service as well as uh, infrastructure as a service with Azure. Uh, and um, uh, last year I joined Docker uh, to work on the, on the Docker platform. So first, why, why am I here? Uh, the, the reason I switched to Docker is um, uh, in uh, 2015, I was playing with Docker while at Microsoft, and I was working with customers, corporate customers who wanted to move their workloads to Azure uh, and wanted to use Docker for that. So I started um, playing a lot with Docker. And to me, it felt uh, like one of these tools where when you start using it every day, um, uh, it changes the way you're building applications. And I had the exact same feeling I had uh, 20 years before uh, in 1995 when the Netscape browser came out. Uh, so when the browser came out, at that time I was building client-server applications. Uh, and when the browser came out, I realized, hey, we can build our applications now on the server side generating HTML and later uh, JavaScript. Uh, and putting all the logic for the application on the server side. Uh, and when I started playing with Docker, I had exactly the same feeling. This is a different way of building and architecting our, our applications. And using the Docker tool, uh, this is the kind of tool where when you start using it every day as a developer, it changes the way you're going to build applications. So that's why I decided to join the company. I like this quote by William Gibson, a science fiction writer from Canada in Euromancer. Uh, he, he says, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And uh, I, the reason I like that sentence is that uh, it's been at the heart of my career. Uh, all my career I tried to go to uh, places where innovation was happening, where the future was already there. Uh, and then it needed to be uh, evenly distributed among uh, the rest of the industry. Uh, so that was true at Google uh, in, uh, in 2009 when we introduced App Engine uh, and the notion of platform as a service. Uh, it was true at VMware uh, when we were doing Cloud Foundry, an open source platform to distribute everywhere. And it was true at Microsoft as well. Uh, I think what we're trying to do right now with Docker is we need to democratize and evenly distribute that notion of container as a service that we've been using internally for quite a while now. So talking about Docker, our mission is to build tools of mass innovation. So what does that mean in the current state? Uh, where innovation is happening is all these devices that get connected to the internet, servers and desktops. It started with servers and desktops. Uh, in the past few years, it went to phones, but right now we're seeing an explosion where cars, houses, drones, and network equipment are getting connected to the internet. The problem for developers when they want to innovate on top of these new devices that are connected uh, is that the, the software development kits and the platform to develop on all of these uh, different uh, devices uh, are very fragmented. So you need to pick a silo, learn it, and you need to learn another silo every time you move to a different uh, device. The problem with that is that uh, to build distributed systems where you have some part that runs on your phone, some parts will run on desktop servers, some part may run in your car or in little devices, uh, you, you need a new programming model for that. And so what we're trying to build at Docker is a software layer to program the internet. 
So why, why do I think uh, Docker has been successful? So that's a slide I used uh, with my team at Microsoft uh, to tell them about how I viewed the cloud market. Uh, so to me, essentially, in the past five years, uh, we've been in, in, in a big war between the three public cloud providers that you can see on the right there. Uh, so you have Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. Each of them has a massive public cloud. Uh, and it's really a three-horse race uh, with Amazon at the top, uh, Microsoft uh, chasing close behind, and uh, Google uh, quite far behind. Uh, and then you have VMware, uh, who owns uh, inside the firewall infrastructure with virtualization. And uh, VMware is mostly talking to IT pros. Uh, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft got their adoption in public cloud through developers. And there's been two trends uh, that I think explain the success of Docker when it appeared on the market three years ago. Uh, and these two trends are one is DevOps, where devs and ops are more and more working together uh, in order to deliver faster and have that cycle of learning uh, that's coming from iterating uh, fast on, on software as a service. Uh, and the other one is a hybrid. Uh, when um, when I started talking to enterprises about uh, moving their workloads to the cloud uh, back in 2010, what they were telling me, and I was at Google at that time, what they were telling me is uh, we are, uh, your, your cloud platform looks really nice, uh, but what we want is something hybrid where I can run some of my workloads uh, behind the firewall and the rest of it in the cloud. Uh, and I think that these trends kind of uh, uh, um, made Docker uh, an instant success when it appeared three years ago, because Docker is the perfect tool for adopting a DevOps approach in your company. Uh, and Docker also provides you that portability layer that lets you switch between inside the firewall and uh, uh, any public cloud. Uh, so to go, to go back to that slide, the analogies I use for the various companies, uh, I, I took them from movies. Uh, so to me, VMware, which is very focused on um, uh, inside the firewall, uh, was trying to have a hybrid strategy with vCloud Air, but it didn't pan out. Uh, they're like 300. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that movie. Uh, it, it's a really fun movie. <laughs> uh, it's about the, this uh, group of 300 Spartans who are resisting an army of 10,000 Persians. And uh, they shot Sparta, and they're very courageous, and they fight uh, uh, very strongly, but at the end, they all die. So that's VMware. Uh, then you have Google. Uh, and Google, to me, is like uh, Marty, that, that uh, teenager character uh, from Back to the Future. I don't know if you've seen that movie. It's the story of a teenager from the 80s who goes back to the 50s. Uh, he goes back in time. And there, uh, at the prom night, he starts playing rock and roll for the audience. And the audience is mesmerized. They love rock and roll. They start dancing. It's really great. But then he gets a little bit too excited, uh, and he starts uh, uh, playing the guitar really hard, and he starts playing hard rock. And for that audience of the 50s who didn't know rock and roll yet, uh, hard rock is really too far in the future for them, so they just don't understand, and, and he... He ends up with an audience that has a dead silence and doesn't understand that music from the future. And that's really how I felt uh, when I was going back in 2010 to enterprises to try to tell them about Google App Engine for Business, a version of App Engine uh, designed for businesses, where they told me, hey, half of our workloads need to run behind the firewall, uh, so there's no way we're going to use your hosted-only platform. Uh, so to me, Google, the, the issue they have in their strategy is the lack of a hybrid platform. I think they made some progress recently uh, with the alliance they have with CoreOS, uh, with that product called Tectonic, which is CoreOS plus Kubernetes that you can install behind the firewall. And then you use uh, um, a Google Compute Engine uh, and Google Container Service uh, in public cloud. Uh, then you have Amazon. Uh, so Amazon, to me, they're like Pacific Rim. Uh, I don't know if you see, saw that movie. Uh, it's a story of uh, huge monsters from another dimension here, the book-selling dimension, who just invade uh, uh, the, the Earth uh, through a fault uh, under the Pacific Ocean. And, um, and that's quite how Amazon invaded the enterprise market and uh, are doing that today. 
Um, and then at the, at the end, we have Microsoft, which to me is like feel the dream, build it and they will come. So Microsoft has this uh, really hybrid strategy where they're doing public cloud with Azure and private cloud with uh, Azure Stack, which has a uh, parity uh, with um, a lot of the features that you get in Azure. And then in the middle of that, you have Docker, uh, which uh, everybody's trying to use right now in order to adopt DevOps and uh, hybrid clouds. So when Docker appeared three years ago, uh, it, the whole industry started reorganizing around it. Uh, and to me, the new stack looks uh, something like what you see in this slide, where at the bottom of it, uh, in the, like 20 years ago when you were doing computing, at the bottom you had the hardware. So right now, uh, it's not the hardware, it's uh, more uh, cloud platforms or virtualization. So you have the three big cloud providers, Azure, Amazon, and Google. And then you have VMware for virtualization. On top of that, you have the operating system. And operating systems uh, um, like became really fat and, and had lots of services, and they were constantly adding new ones. When Docker started to appear uh, and you were putting all your dependencies inside of a container, uh, the OS started shrinking. And uh, it started with CoreOS, uh, who started with a distribution, a minimal Linux distribution, uh, that has a few tools for managing clusters, and then uh, a Docker engine, and that's it. That's all you have in there. Uh, then, very quickly, uh, other OS providers followed suit. Uh, so, uh, Red Hat came up with Project Atomic, which is their version of a small OS uh, designed to run containers. Uh, then there was Ubuntu with Ubuntu Core. Uh, and uh, VMware came out with Photon, uh, their own Linux distro. My favorite in this bunch is uh, Rancher OS, because uh, they go all the way uh, to get rid of everything in a Linux distro. They just run two Docker engines, uh, one for privileged Docker, where you run your system containers in privilege mode, uh, and then one for um, uh, userland Docker, where you run your regular workloads. And one thing to note is that even Microsoft shrunk uh, Windows for containers. So they have, um, as part of the Windows Server 2016 TP4, they have something that's called Nano Server. It's a really small version of Windows Server where they got rid of everything. Uh, there's no UI, and it's really designed to run in the data center to run very dense workloads of containers uh, in there. And so Windows Server uh, 2016 TP4 has now support for Docker. Uh, I, I think it's not completely finished, but you can start playing with it uh, today. There are lots of blog posts about that. Then on top of that, you have Docker, which is at the center of that ecosystem. On the left, what you see is uh, plugins. So Docker, uh, Docker's philosophy is really uh, batteries included, uh, but, but removable. So you can swap the batteries for different subsystems of Docker. Here we're talking about the, the volume plugins, for example. Uh, they are uh, Gluster FS or Clucker lets you uh, uh, just change the way uh, volume plugins work, and so you can use their system for managing your volumes across a cluster of nodes. And same thing for networking. Docker uh, comes with batteries included for networking, including overlay networking over uh, several nodes. Uh, but you can swap that for one of the uh, four or five implementations using Wii, Calico, Midokura, Cisco, or the new Edge Networks plugin. Then on the right, you have uh, orchestration. And orchestration is really where the big battle is this year. Uh, I'd say you have the three main uh, uh, contenders are Docker Swarm. So it's orchestration, Docker native orchestration by Docker. Uh, you have Apache Mesos, uh, which is pretty mature and has been used a lot in conjunction with Docker. And then you have uh, Kubernetes, which is the open source project by Google for orchestrating container. But you have a lot of others, like DS, which is trying to reproduce a Heroku-like experience um, uh, within your data center, and it's open source. Uh, Cloud Foundry, which uh, with the Diego project, tried to reinvent itself as a Docker orchestration engine. Um, uh, IBM Bluemix, uh, which is based on Cloud Foundry and OpenStack, but also has a Docker service. Uh, Apprenda, which has a Docker service and adds some security-related uh, features for enterprises. 
Uh, and then Tutum, which was uh, acquired by Docker. Uh, so Tutum is a, an online um, or a, a software as a service uh, online manager for your Docker containers. Uh, and it's been uh, rebranded and relaunched in GA uh, yesterday uh, uh, in the form of Docker Cloud. So we announced that yesterday. We're very excited about that, and I'll show you how that works. So the Docker mission is to build tools to help people build, ship, and run distributed applications uh, anywhere on any hardware, any infrastructure. So one of the things that analysts used to to talk about when they they, they talk about the um, uh, the cloud market is this uh, classic horrendous pyramid where you have infrastructure as a service at the bottom. Uh, which is infrastructure that's programmable through APIs. On top of that, you install a platform as a service, so either it's managed by the provider, like Google App Engine, uh, or you just install it on top of infrastructure as a service, like you do with Cloud Foundry. Uh, and then on top of that, as a developer or an operations, you're building software as a service that you deliver to your customers. The problem with that model is that it doesn't fit the current uh, container as a service uh, model. And uh, so I've been pitching that model, that pyramid, uh, and pitching platform as a service for a long time. Like uh, this is me in, uh, uh, when I was at Google, uh, at Google Developer Day Brazil in 2010, uh, pitching that vision. And uh, this is me again, like two years uh, later in 2012 in Tokyo, pitching Cloud Foundry as the open source platform as a service. The problem with that vision is what you see there. Uh, I don't know if you know the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Uh, the three bears that you can see there, uh, you have a, a daddy bear there that you can see on the left, and uh, he has a big ball of uh, infrastructure as a service. And uh, he needs to learn Chef and Puppet and Ansible, and he's not very happy to have to learn all that. That's a too low level of abstraction for him. Then on the right, you have Mommy Bear, uh, who is using a pass, and she's a developer. Uh, and uh, she's using that path, and uh, she's saying, hey, this is too high level of abstraction. I want to, for example, I'm building a Ruby app, and I need a specific version of ImageMagick uh, installed on that machine, and I want to ship that as a dependency with my application, and your path doesn't allow that today. Uh, so path is too, too high level. And there you can see Little Bear. Uh, he's using Docker and Container as a service, and he says this is just right. Uh, the Docker image is the right level of abstraction for developers to put all their apps and dependencies into something that's called a container, and then apps have the tools and control to deploy that in production. So I'd say in that uh, classic pyramid, uh, platform as a service is too high, uh, infrastructure as a service is too low, and uh, as Goldilocks would say, container as a service is just right. So we should replace that uh, pyramid by, uh, by this pyramid where you have infrastructure as a service. On top of it, you install some container as a service system, and then on top of that, you can build software as a service. So Docker container as a service, uh, the formal definition is an IT managed and secure application content and infrastructure where developers can self-service. The self-service aspect is very important uh, uh, to uh, build and deploy applications. So the Docker journey uh, uh, towards container as a service, it starts with agility. Developers want to be agile. Agile is really a differentiating, uh, it's a, a competitive differentiator uh, with other companies. You can iterate very fast on your software, your learning, you don't build in use less features. You, all the features that you're building, you get feedback from your customers uh, in real time. The other aspect that's super important, especially in enterprises, is portability. Uh, so by default, Docker technologies give apps portability across environments. So you can build your application and then deploying on any of the cloud providers or any uh, internal infrastructure that you have from virtualization to base metal. And so what happened in the first two years of uh, Docker uh, life is uh, lots of developers adopted Docker for these benefits of agility and portability, using it in pre-production environment uh, for continuous integration uh, use cases. What's happening this year 
uh, is that uh, finally there are some tools that emerge uh, to build a real container as a service uh, uh, that give IT pros the control that they need to run these dockerized applications in production. So the teams need to secure, manage infrastructure, applications, and service levels. And so that's what we call uh, Docker Container as a Service, a platform that allows you the agility, portability, and control uh, that you need in order to uh, deploy your, wor your workloads. So talking about the lessons we learn when talking to developers, so developers don't adopt lockdown systems. So Docker is open source, and there's a whole ecosystem around it. Uh, the existing end-to-end -end solutions for deploying containers, there are lots of them out there for orchestration. Uh, very often, they, they tend to break the Docker experience, and I'll tell you about that. And the last aspect is uh, uh, developers and IT pros beware of lock-in and loss of portability. Portability is a super important concern. And in order to reiterate that fact, uh, we're just going to play a little game. Uh, it's called Where's Waldo? So I don't know if you know that game. Uh, it's called Where, Where, Where's Waldo? Uh, so Waldo is that little character that you see at the, at the top left there. And the game is uh, it, it, it's in the form of books where you have very complicated images. And in there, you need to find uh, Waldo. So I, I actually don't know where it is. I, I hope you have better eyes than I have. Uh, we're going to play that game of where's Waldo when looking at uh, different orchestration solutions to determine where Docker is in there. So one hint I can give you is that uh, Waldo here is on the top right. So let's take a look at some of these uh, orchestration solutions. If you're using Google Container Engine and you look at their documentation, where's Waldo? Oh, uh, I use Docker to build my images at the beginning. So I do a Docker build. After that, it's all G Cloud stuff. So I don't need to tell you that all this G Cloud stuff plus KubeCTL is not possible. So if you're using that on Google Container Engine, uh, that won't work on Amazon. Uh, the G Cloud part of it, KubeCTL, you may be able to install uh, Kubernetes on Amazon. Uh, it's uh, not for the faint of heart, uh, but it's doable. So there are some parts that are portable, but a lot of it is not. So in Kubernetes, Docker is buried in there as the daemon that makes, uh, that runs your containers that your pods are, are constituted of. If you're using EC2 uh, container service, uh, Amazon ECS, uh, you can see you're using ECS CLI uh, with a bunch of uh, parameters and uh, just in the middle you create a compose file, but then you don't, need, you don't use Docker compose, you use ECS CLI compose. Uh, and so that's another example of something that's really not portable. So the day you want to switch from uh, ECS to Google or to uh, Microsoft or to your internal infrastructure, that just doesn't work. In Red Hat, uh, actually when you're looking at the Red Hat documentation for how to start with Docker, it's like OpenShift this and OpenShift Kubi and uh, then you're curling some stuff and uh, there's nothing portable in there. And in Red Hat, you can see Docker is like buried in there uh, behind the kubelet and the kube proxy uh, close to the ET server, ETB server. And when you're looking at Pivotal Cloud Foundry, so they have this thing called Diego, uh, but that's not really running a Docker engine. I think they're moving to run C right now. Uh, so you use the, the CF command line, so CF API, CF auth, CF create, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then at the end, uh, you do a CF push, so there's no Docker in there, so that, that won't be possible uh, across Docker installations. You need to have Cloud Foundry installed for that stuff to run. So in Pivotal Cloud Foundry, Docker is hidden in there in what they call Garden Linux. Uh, that's, I, I think they're running their own version of that right now, but they're going to replace this with RunC, which is the um, open Container uh, Initiative implement, uh, Reference Implementation for uh, Containers. So Docker as a CAS platform. Uh, so it's a platform to build, ship, and run applications. Build is a developer workflow. Ship is really where uh, there's collaboration between dev and ops uh, around secure content. And run is where you deploy, manage, and scale uh, your containers and your applications, and that's typically where the IT pros uh, and ops teams are working. 
So what do we have to uh, uh, to build, ship, and run in Docker? Uh, so we have a bunch of tools for the build workflows, uh, some tools for uh, shipping, and some tools for running. And when you look at the at the tools themselves, so for building we have the, uh, the Docker toolbox. So Docker toolbox uh, includes uh, uh, the Docker command line, uh, Docker engine. If you are installing it on Mac or Windows, it's installed inside of a VirtualBox VM running a Linux distribution. Uh, that's called boot to Docker, uh, and then you have Docker Compose, uh, and you have uh, Cakematic and Docker Machine to provision machines. So that's what developers are using. Uh, then on the ship side, uh, we have uh, hosted offerings uh, in software as a service mode, uh, and then on-premise uh, on-premise offerings. So on the hosted offering side, there's Docker Hub that lets you manage your images. Uh, you can do that for public images, but you can also pay for private repositories. Um, and then you have Docker Trusted Registry, which is uh, a version of the open source registry with added enterprise features like uh, uh, integration with LDAP and Active Directory, role-based access control, uh, that you can install behind the firewall to let uh, teams manage uh, their secure content in there. Uh, and, and both of them are working with uh, Docker Content Trust, which lets developers sign images, uh, and IT pros manage the sign images. Uh, then on the run side, uh, we have uh, Docker Universal Control Plane, or Docker Data Center. Uh, actually, Docker Data Center is an, an offering that comes with our Docker subscription or behind the firewall that includes Docker Trusted Registry and Docker Universal Control Plane. The universal control plane is a way to manage uh, your containers, monitor them, manage logs and, and all that behind the firewall, but you can also install it on a cloud infrastructure. Uh, and then Docker Cloud uh, uh, was launched uh, yesterday, so I highly advise you to go try it out. Uh, you go to cloud.docker.com, you can log in with your Docker Hub username, username and password, uh, and there uh, you can start bringing your own nodes uh, so you bring your own infrastructure nodes, whether from one of the five cloud providers that we support, or you can bring your own node from behind the firewall. So there are instructions for how to do that. And after that, uh, you can use the user interface uh, to deploy and manage your containers. I'll show you how to do that. Uh, and um, uh, to, so to deploy and manage your containers, and it's a, a hosted offering. And all these offerings are on top of Docker Engine. Uh, and all the open source components, uh, including networking, volume, uh, and all that. And there's a whole ecosystem of plugins and integrations that work with it. So the characteristics of a container as a service, it addresses the needs of both developers and IT pros. Uh, it supports all the stages in an application life cycle, build, ship, and run. Uh, it works in any language, any operating system. So Windows is coming. Uh, uh, Docker support is uh, coming in Windows Server. Uh, you can try it out today with uh, Windows Server uh, 2016 TP4. Uh, any infrastructure, uh, so it works with all cloud providers, uh, all the virtualization providers, as well as on bare metal. It has open API and a pluggable architecture, and there's a broad ecosystem behind it. So what do enterprises do with uh, a Docker container as a service? So there are a bunch of initiatives like containerization, moving to a microservice arch uh, style architecture, uh, multi-cloud projects where you want to deploy some of your workloads in one, one cloud and some in, in one other. So Docker provides you the portability for that. Uh, a lot of companies are building, uh, they used to build a uh, platform as a service, now they're, they're building developer self-service, container as a service offerings, uh, managing data pipeline, that's a, a, a very hot topic these days. Uh, so hybrid clouds where you have part of your workloads that you deploy inside the firewall, maybe for regulatory reasons or strategic reasons, uh, and the other part that you, de that you deploy in various clouds. Uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, and DevOps. And I'm going to show you two examples of how uh, actual uh, Docker customers have been using that. Uh, I, I can't disclose the name yet, but this will give you an idea of the kind of architecture they're putting together. Uh, so this example is a decentralized uh, container as a service for hybrid, and the goal here is to do hybrid and multi-cloud portability. 
so what that means is they have a central portal from which uh, developers and teams can provision resources, uh, manage role-based access control to the uh, vir virtual private cloud and data center uh, resources uh, that are assigned to them. And then they have um, a hosted application trust uh, templates in a Docker Trusted Registry. What they do from that central portal is that they are going to deploy uh, a, a universal control plane and a Docker Trusted Registry uh, for each of their um, for each of their apps. Uh, so each team gets their own instance of UCP and DTR. Uh, and they can, uh, and these instances can either be on Amazon or in another cloud like Microsoft Azure uh, or in their private data center because uh, uh, this company is working in a regulated industry so they have a bunch of their applications that need to uh, be in the private data center. Another example that we have there is a centralized CAS for transformation to adopt DevOps and microservices. So this company used to build a lot of applications internally each of these apps had their own stack for auth and, and app registration and marketplace logging and all that. And so, so they were working in silos and they're going to a completely centralized uh, uh, CAS installation where they have one Docker trusted registry and one Docker universal control plane set up for the whole company. They manage role-based access control for that for teams. So authorization, app registration, session management, marketplace integration, and logging. All these services are provided as components, microservices, where the images for these microservices are present in the trusted registry so they can be managed centrally. And then they are reused when building their, um, their microservices applications. And these are deployed into, um, uh, into nodes that are either on Amazon Web Services or OpenStack internally uh, behind the firewall. Uh, so this is a hybrid setup, uh, but these are all managed by the same installation of a Docker Universal Control Plane. So basically, uh, Universal Control Plane uh, gives you the choice of whether you want to do things in a centralized or decentralized way. And I'm just going to end with a, a quick demo. Of, uh, because Docker Cloud shipped yesterday, so I'm just going to show it to you if you haven't tried it yet. Uh, so one other thing I'm going to show you is a small uh, Spring Boot application. Uh, so Spring Boot is a framework uh, in Java uh, from the Spring team uh, that's designed to build microservices. And this application has a nice UI uh, uh, in JavaScript, uh, a Spring Boot backend uh, that, that manages the API. And then uh, the backend database is MongoDB with MongoFS. So what the app is doing is it lets you drag and drop images or upload images and it will transform these images. Uh, so let's take a look at this app and, uh, and how, to, um, how to leverage that in, um, uh, in, in Docker. Okay, so I'm just going to show you the Docker Compose file for this. Uh, actually, I'm going to show you the old Docker Compose file. So here we have a Docker Compose file where we have two services, uh, the web service, which is my Spring Boot image. Uh, so I, I have built it before and I have pushed it to uh, Docker Hub at Shannon Spring Doggy. Uh, here I export a port, uh, 8090. I put a link to the MongoDB image. Uh, so that's going to make a link between my web service and my Mongo service. Uh, and then for the Mongo service, I just stopped the Mongo image. Uh, in a production environment, you would just maybe mount a, a volume uh, for for the data to be uh, um, um, uh, to to persist. Uh, and then here I have an environment variable that I pass to my my app, which is uh, where my app is going to uh, connect to the Mongo database. So here, the Instead of passing an IP address, I'm just passing Mongo, which is the name of that service here. So I'm just going to take that compose file, and I'm going to go to Docker Cloud. Uh, yeah, so that's Docker Cloud. Uh, so you log in with your uh, hub credentials, uh, and then you need to provision nodes, uh, because Docker Cloud is running your containers on nodes that you provide. 
So in order to pro to provision nodes, uh, what you can do is you can launch um, a new node cluster. And the way you do that is that you, you set up Docker Cloud to give it your uh, cloud provider credentials. So here I give it my uh, Microsoft Azure credentials. Uh, but I could uh, give it my Amazon Web Services, DigitalOcean, SoftLayer, or Packet credentials. So here I'll pick Microsoft Azure. Uh, it's uh, Pat. Uh, I'm going to give it a name. So Pat Docker Cloud 3. Uh, I don't need any deploy tag. You can choose some provider specific settings. So here I'm going to deploy an EQS and a basic A1 instance, but I, I could provision like much larger instances if needed. I specify the number of nodes and then I can launch the node cluster. So it's creating it and behind the scene is going to provision a VM uh, uh, in Azure uh, with Docker uh, engine installed on it uh, with the right PLS setup. It's going to keep, so, um, Docker Cloud is going to keep my certificate so it can deploy um, containers on my behalf, uh, and then um, uh, is going to mount, uh, is going to provision um, uh, 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 Microsoft Storage uh, bucket, and then mount that as a disk, and uh, put valid Docker on that, uh, so that uh, it um, uh, subsists beyond reboots of the machine. Uh, so that's. I'm going to let it work, and you can see I have already some nodes uh, provisioned there. So I'm just going to use that. Then there's the notion of service, and service is just a Docker container. So you can run a Docker container in there, and if I create a service, I'm going to provide the same arguments uh, in a web UI uh, that I would provide on the command line. And I can also use the command line with Tutu. Uh, so here I'm going to search for uh, the Mongo image. So I'm going to search a Docker Hub. I found the official. Mongo image, I can select it, and then I can specify a bunch of parameters like which port I want to expose, whether I want to auto restart. So I won't go into the details of that. I'm just going to let you do the last thing, which is stacks. So stacks are like a Docker Compose file. It's actually an extension of the Compose file format with a few added things, uh, but it, it supports uh, most of the Docker Compose uh, file format. And here you can see I have running my Spring Doggy uh, application. I'm just going to show you what a stack file is. So a stack file is basically the, um, you can see my, um, uh, the, um, the compose file that I just showed you in there. Uh, that's the same as a stack file. So you just put your, paste your compose file in there and then you ask it to start the service. It's just going to start all the instances. Uh, and then you can go to the endpoint and uh, just go directly to there, and you can see that um, uh, the app should be running. Yeah, so the app is running. Uh, so my app has been deployed, and then I can just go to uh, uh, desktop and take one image. Uh, let's take the XI logo in there. I'm just dragging and dropping it. And so what the app is doing when I do that is that it's, uh, um, oops, oh yeah. So it's processing the image and uh, adding a bunch of uh, WD on that. So that's it. So, so now my app has been deployed. And when I dig deeper uh, into the, when I dig deeper into the services, you can see that I'm running a, a bunch of applications already. So the Python quick start, this one is a, a more interesting stack that has a load balancer in front of it, so I have a chip proxy. So Docker Cloud has a, a special image called a Docker Cloud HA proxy, which is going to automat automatically do the load balancing with your, um, uh, with your here, the web uh, image that I have in there. So when you're running that, it's, it's doing load balancing between four different instances of the web, uh, of the web instance. Actually, let's stop this one. It's, uh, um, so you can see when I start, oops, no development. Ah, okay, so I, I'm using port 18 node already, so I, I would need to uh, to wait for the other node to be uh, provisioned. Or I need to modify uh, my stack file to expose a different port. Uh, so I could do that. 
but okay, I, I just won't go into the details of that, but basically you can modify your stack files, run your stacks, and run your service, and monitor them uh, directly from the web UI, and there's a command line for that as well. Uh, so that concludes my talk about the container as a service. So Docker container as a service is really about uh, agility, portability, and control. Uh, and uh, it provides developers and IT pros some, uh, uh, some products and services that let them uh, work together and collaborate um, uh, for, for uh, shipping or, or creating their applications and uh, uh, running their, their workloads to build, ship, and run uh, distributed applications. Thanks. So, oh, let, let's maybe take a few, uh, few questions. Okay, so questions. Uh, from John D, what's the movie for Docker then? Oh, actually, I've been asked that question many times. I still need to find it. Uh, please tweet at me. I'm uh, at Shannon uh, for uh, suggestions about what the movie should be for uh, for Docker. I, I, I need to uh, I really need to update that. Um, another question uh, from Andrew Di Lorenzo. How come the only cloud that can run Docker on bare metal, Giant Triton, isn't shown? Oh, actually, I used to have a, a Triton on that, uh, but then I, I, I so so Triton is a service by Giant. Uh, it runs on Solaris, and they put a front end in front of their uh, in front of their platform that talks to Docker API. Uh, so it's a bare metal service that runs Docker. Uh, I used to have it in that in that layer, but then I, I, I was lacking room for there, uh, so I ended up removing it to make the other logos bigger. Maybe I should add it again. You're right. Uh, so good good catch there. Uh, from Daniel Hansen, under orchestration of the Linux container ecosystem slide, I see Swarm and Uh So Docker has two different orchestration engines. How do they compare? Contrast? How will these two integrate, or will they become one? So actually, um, so uh, Damien, that's a very good question. Uh, and I would say Docker has only actually one orchestration uh, engine. And this orchestration engine is called Swarm. It's an open source project, so you can run it by yourself. However, we package uh, Swarm uh, with other management uh, features uh, into two products. One that software as a service, so this is Docker Cloud. Uh, so it's using Swarm behind the scenes, but it's the same orchestration engine that's used. And the other one that's uh, a universal control plane that you can install behind the firewall. Uh, since uh, behind the firewall and software as a service, have, customers usually have slightly different requirements. That's why we're having uh, two form factors uh, so that we can address the whole market. Uh, uh, Dr. Will, oh, Dr. Will, Tim Crockett, I, we should send you a t-shirt, you should uh, uh, send, like, tweet to Docker about, uh, um, uh, with, with your, uh, with your uh, Twitter handle, and we'll start a conversation, you deserve a t-shirt for that, for detecting where uh, Dr. Will was located at the top right of the picture. Uh, then Luke uh, Jaggery, I use Docker Cloud and I really like it, uh, but will there be a merge between Docker Cloud and Compose so that Compose file can be directly used without having to create a stack? Or in the other way around, will stack become first class citizen in a Compose file? Okay, so uh, I don't know the complete answer to that, which is to the second part. Uh, will stack be become a first class citizen in Compose file, uh, you should ask that question to Anand or, or Borja uh, from the cloud team or the Compose team. I don't know what their plans are there, uh, but for the Compose file itself, uh, there are only three instructions in Compose file that, that don't work in stack, things like build, for example, which doesn't make sense over there, because they're doing a build anyway. Uh, but apart from that, you can use your Compose file uh, in stack today. Uh, then from Girish, there are already services like Amazon Container Service, how Docker Cloud is different from that. Uh, so the way Docker Cloud is different from that is that as I showed you in the Where's Weldo uh, uh, <laughs> sequence, uh, if you're using uh, Amazon Container Service, you're using the uh, ECS uh, client uh, to develop and deploy your workloads and it's not possible. Uh, Docker Cloud lets you uh, deploy your uh, your containers on any of the cloud providers that we support, 
as well as on uh, bring your own notes. So you can bring a Linux notes from behind the firewall and we will manage it with uh, Docker Cloud. So Docker Cloud provides you that portability that Amazon Container Service doesn't. Uh, Team Crockett can uh, Docker Cloud provision to either VMware, private public cloud, or, Docker, or Google Cloud. So no, uh, Google Cloud is not part of the list today. Uh, I don't know if it's on the roadmap or not, I, I bet it is. Uh, and VMware, uh, public private cloud, uh, neither, there's no, um, there's no uh, driver for that. However, for both Google Cloud and VMware, private public cloud, you can still use the bring your own node version. So you just need to make sure that the networking, so you need to provision your, your VMs and install Linux on it. Uh, and, and after that, if you follow the instructions for bring your own node, you'll be able to bring these nodes into uh, Docker Cloud. Uh, but it won't be, the provisioning won't be automated. You still need to provision manually in Docker Cloud or in Google Cloud or in uh, uh, VMware. Uh, can you share resources uh, between stacks? Um, uh, this one, actually, I don't know if you can share resources between stacks. I don't think um, I don't think you can, um, but you can uh, you can use the, the public URLs and ports that are exposed by stacks uh, in order to have the, the services interconnect. Uh, and maybe I'll take one last question. Uh, so, what's the difference between Docker Compose and Swarm? So Docker Compose is a tool that you're using on your laptop. Uh, it's not a daemon, it's a command that you're running. Uh, and it lets you, uh, it analyzes the Compose file and makes sure that the engine that it's talking to uh, uh, just has all the containers in the state that it's been asked to. For example, scaling up a node or things like that. Uh, while Docker Swarm is uh, an orchestration engine, so it's a daemon that's running on the server uh, that does the orchestration for you and that fronts several Docker engines and it talks the same API as Docker engine. So Docker Compose is more a developer tools, but I know that a lot of uh, IT pros are using it for managing workloads as well, that you use to manage your workloads. And Docker Swarm uh, is the engine that is uh, doing the work behind the scenes. Uh, and then uh, one last question, maybe, is there any command line tools to manage Docker Cloud? Yeah, there is one, uh, and uh, guess how it's called? It's called Docker-Cloud. Uh, so if you're on a Mac, if you go to the documentation uh, for Docker Cloud, you find on a Mac it's a blue install uh, Docker Cloud. Simple. Okay, so I, I, I think we'll stop at that. Uh, thank you very much for attending today, and I uh, hope it gives you a uh, desire to explore uh, Docker Cloud, uh, Universal Control Plane, and Docker Data Center, uh, and start to adopt a platform as, uh, a container as a service uh, uh, at your company or in your project. Thank you.